On the last program, we had Joseph Takax, and he's a marine engineer. And he told us a few things about what's happening with marinas. Now, one of my problems is the marinas that here in Australia, they don't, actually in Sydney, they, we're paying a lot of money, but they don't have a break wall. So the waves can actually break onto the wall and they don't make a big, uh, big waves into the marina. So the boats move up and down. Now, what we're saying is, the, the officials, the bureaucrats, they're saying, oh, no, 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 you cannot do that for whatever reason. And what we're saying is, I wonder if we can ask the people, for example, what the people will say, if they want this to happen or not. And the next thing that we looked at, it was about the moorings. Yep, we looked at the moorings and we said that we have a lot of big waiting lists everywhere in Sydney and a lot of other cities, big cities in Australia. And we wonder, why don't they just use the same trick that they use in other places around the world, like this particular docks? So there is a solution to everything. And that way you don't have to have big waiting lists. You have a beautiful platform you can work on your boat. Again, I wonder, instead of waiting for these bureaucrats to make a decision the next 10 years or so, if we actually put it to the people of New South Wales or Sydney and say, hey guys, do you want to have this particular mooring instead of the swing moorings and then let the people decide. I think that's actually the best way. We never tried, maybe we should give it a go. And then Joseph explained to us how he's trying to unify this uh, minor parties at this coming elections. I've got a group on Facebook called Australians for Genuine Change in Government. And this is a unification group which gives a voice and gives a platform and a stage for minor parties and independents who represent the majority of Australians with a general, general set of basic core values that they can come together, they can talk, they can work together and show the people of Australia that having a group of independents and minor parties in government won't restrict the ability of any government to actually lead the country it'll be beneficial because these people will have direct interaction, direct uh, operations relating to all facets of government and have interaction with the people, the citizens of the country to look after their best interests and actually represent the people, not representing the corporate interests as the major parties in Australia currently do. You're just trying to unite the small parties into one voice. Y yes, I'm trying to bring together the minor parties yeah. that that share the core values of all Australians. Okay, now the other thing we talked with uh, Joe was about the uh, idea of just putting all the trains in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane perhaps underground like they do all around the world and use that space above ground to build houses for our youth. Let's have a look at that. One question that uh, I have for you is about our railway system. I did a report earlier in an earlier episode about uh, the railways, or what we call metros around the world, which they're all underground. Everywhere you go in Europe, it's all underground. I come back to Australia after a few years working in Europe, and I see that we still got what I call the dinosaur up on the surface, taking valuable space. I mean, we don't have enough land for our children to just build the houses, and uh, you see how expensive everything is. And then instead of just digging underground, we got this train still up there. Now, digging underground, it would just create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, underground here in Sydney is very, very good. It's sandstone, very easy to dig. So I would just imagine maybe the gain it would be a people's decision. People can decide because the politicians, I don't think that they're interested. But if we can get the people to decide if they want an underground system or not, do you think that that would be a good idea? Bradfield and Carl had this vision in the 1920s to put eight lanes across the harbour. Thousands of people walked across the bridge. Today, around 176,000 motor vehicles and 400 trains cross the Harbour Bridge every weekday. In the 80s, they put the Harbour Tunnel in two lanes either way. M5, two lanes either way. M2, two lanes either way. And you've got to really wonder what these people are actually doing in government because if they can't make a decision for the growth of the nation, I'd we have no hope. Maybe our politicians don't have the same vision like our politicians back in those days because it's so easy to start uh, planning and researching and finding out, first of all, if it's feasible. And I think that it's something that will help not only just the, um, the movement of people but also the traffic because we can connect then the streets that the railway lines are actually at the moment, they just cut in half. Isn't that correct? 
oh, you'd free up a lot of free space. But yet again, we get talk, go back in time and we look at the vision of the people who built the underground railway lines around Sydney. You look at Town Hall Station, you look at Wynyard Station, Central Station. People don't realise that there is numerous ghost platforms all around in this underground network that have never actually been connected into the system. They had that vision then, yet then they pop out at Redfern and all of a sudden everything is all above ground for the rest of Sydney and they've wasted and they've got this this wasteland, wasteland. noise. Wasteland, I like that. Well, it's a wasteland of noise. <laughs> degradation of these areas they need to consolidate that landmass put the infrastructure underground what about the um the actual infrastructure that we need like retaining walls when we're on the ground instead of uh, underground isn't that more money involved in that yeah well the financial burden and the construction and the maintenance of any underground tunnels and engineering and infrastructure would be significantly reduced. We don't have a massive burden on the economy to maintain the underground stations around Sydney. I mean, we've seen a lot of, uh, through the news, you can see it now, a lot of uh, collapses of retaining walls. At Linden, a commuter train derailed when the embankment collapsed across the tracks late yesterday. Crews worked through icy nighttime conditions to clear the line. It wasn't until early morning that the train was towed away for repair. The retaining wall collapsed just before 6pm and just a couple of hours later a second section gave way. The western line and adjoining platform are covered in debris, mud, twisted metal, bricks, concrete, stretching for about 50 metres. Three landslides in 48 hours cut rail services between Springwood and Katoomba. Debris narrowly miss motorists. Besieged by delays, Blue Mountains commuters spent the day being bundled between trains and buses. When you're underground, you don't have that problem, do you? To actually put the infrastructure underground and build everything in a sustainable and an efficient manner would just benefit all Australians. And also, Joe mentioned something that is very important. Remember on one episode we mentioned about the foreign aid and how just give a lot of foreign aid to foreign countries and sometimes this money, it actually ends up in corrupt organizations, the money disappears, they never just reach the schools, and there is ghost schools everywhere in India, Indonesia, that they're supposed to be going building schools, but the schools don't exist. They admitted themselves, actually India said it, that uh, actually we don't have any schools, yeah. And we said, why do we actually give aid when uh, we don't know where the money goes? To countries that, I mean, India has a, a space program, Indonesia is the uh, strongest military nation in the Southeast Asia, and we still give them aid. I mean, I'm sure they have a lot of money to spend on their own schools, don't they? That's, that was one thing that we discussed. And then we said, we have a lot of homeless people here in Australia. We have the servicemen in need, the returned servicemen in need, that a lot of them commit suicide, and a lot of them end up to be homeless themselves. And our pensioners, that they live on this tiny little pension, and they are on a forced diet. They cannot buy the uh, ingredients for their food because they don't have the money. But we give a lot of money out as a foreign aid. Three billion dollars to Indonesia the last three years. And look at our debt clock ticking away. So Joe also had this to say about the pensions. Can you just give us some example of this thing you mentioned earlier about the wages? Salary of a Prime Minister is $508,000 plus allowances a year. A retired Prime Minister gets 307000 plus allowances including officers and staff for the rest of their lives. A salary of a senator or backbencher is approximately $195,000 a year plus allowances and when they retire, depending on years of service, can get anywhere from one hundred and twenty-five dollars to $180,000.
This is in stark contrast to the award wages of blue collar workers. Fully qualified tradesmen will get between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a year. If you decide to join the armed forces, the base salary of a soldier is forty eight thousand odd dollars a year plus a service allowance and uniform allowance. The income of a single pensioner is just $20,498 on the old age pension in Australia. This is a stark contrast to the base pensions of backbenchers and senators who receive 10 times that amount of money per year. They get all the lurks and perks, but pensioners are told that they're a burden on society and told to tighten their belts even further.